now we're official. <laughs> Hi, my name is Heather Riggs. I'm Director of Administration here at the New England Museum Association. I would like to welcome you to our February lunch with NEMA with Erin Weberbrook Muscaitis. I said that right, correct? Yes. <laughs> Not that you haven't worked with me for like years. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, good. We have some Salt Lake City people. Shout out to that. Um, I actually went to the University of Utah, so welcome. <laughs> but before we get going, um, I would like to say that today's session is being recorded and will be available on the NEMA website later on this afternoon. If you ever miss a NEMA webinar or a town hall, just check our website. Um, all those recordings will be found there. So we have a big agenda today, so I'm going to turn it over to Erin to introduce fully introduce yourself and your new consulting business, which is amazing. So Erin, it's all you. Great, thank you, Heather, for the introduction and thank you to the NEMA staff um, for all their hard work in continuing to serve and engage the museum community um, during these COVID times. Um, I, many of you are probably already familiar with me. Um, some of you are not from the museum community, um, so welcome. This is not uh, necessarily gonna be geared just to museums. Um, but to the idea of workplace culture in general. Um, I started Yellow Room Consulting um, after spending 15 years in the art and museum education spaces and was really looking to bring my experience to sectors and industries, uh, looking for innovative ways to increase empathy, build um, employee curiosity and respectfulness and improve team dynamics. Um, I truly do believe that art is the key to creating a more compassionate society. So that's what drives me um, in the work that I do. Uh, before we get started today, we do wanna uh, ask you a few quick questions. So Scarlett's gonna put up a poll. Um, and if very quickly you can just answer those questions, that'll give me a sense of your backgrounds. over half. Looks like we've got 77% of folks voting. Um, do you want me to end it? Sure. Thanks. All right, thanks everyone for, um, for answering those questions. So it looks like the majority are already familiar with VTS, um, um, but, but a, a larger majority don't have any VTS programs at their institutions. Okay. Great, thank you very much. So we're gonna go ahead and um, get started on the presentations. We can move forward since we have a lot to get through. Um, Heather, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Go for it. I should also mention if anybody has any questions to go ahead, um, you can either use the chat or the Q&A we'll be answering there um, as well. Great, so I already introduced myself. I'm absolutely delighted to be here. I hope the sun is shining where you are um, here in New England. We're absolutely thrilled to have some warm, slightly warmer winter weather and sunshine. Um, as I said, we have a lot to get through today. Uh, I like to really pack it in. Um, so right at the beginning, we're gonna do a VTS demo conversation um, for those who aren't familiar with it. Um, and even those who are, sometimes it's nice to have a refresher if you haven't experienced a VTS discussion in a while. I'm very quickly going to go through VTS basics. Obviously, the purpose of this webinar is not to introduce and train you in VTS, um, but I just want to make sure everybody's on the same uh, on the same playing field and their understanding. 
we're going to consider ways to apply it to the workplace, specifically with staff. I am not talking about using it with visitors today. Um, we're going to go into a little more detail on the benefits of continued exposure to VTS. And then, of course, we'll contemplate ways that you can implement what we're talking about um, at your museum or your home uh, institution, your company. So let's start off with some art. Everyone can take a moment of silent looking. And for those volunteers, just be ready to unmute yourself when uh, you want to chime into the conversation. So I'll take one moment. All right, what's going on in this picture? Laura. Hello. So it looks like uh, there's a group of friends uh, having dinner and enjoying their time. And I came to that conclusion based on their facial expressions. It looks like they're smiling, they're showing the teeth. Uh, they're uh, they all feel like very comfortable, like the way they're sitting, also the gestures that they're using, they're here. And uh, probably they're enjoying uh, a nice dinner. I could, I could see someone carrying uh, what it looks like maybe a chicken or something in the, in the background. And they're also enjoying some drinks. All right, Laura has drawn her eye to the central grouping here. And she suggested that this is a group of friends um, that are having a good time together, enjoying a meal. And she's particularly noticed uh, the facial expressions, um, the teeth, we're seeing smiles, we're seeing teeth being exposed. She's also noticed the body composition, the body language. Um, these people look very relaxed. We're seeing arms on the table, um, some casual poses in the chairs. And then she's also noticed this figure in the back here um, holding what she suggests could be a chicken or some kind of dinner. What more can we find? Um, it kind of seems to me like it might be um, from a time when there's a transition um, in the, the, the spaces that and roles in society that Black people are allowed to take in America. So what are you seeing that makes you say that? So, we have our revelers at dinner um, and they all have black or brown skin, but then we also have a server who is black. And then it looks like in the image behind everyone, the painting on the wall and the painting, it looks like those people might be white. And I think it's interesting to have this like white art going on there. But then we also have like a portrait um, that's partly obscured by the lamp that looks like it's like maybe a black matriarch or something. And so it feels like this could be some black family that has come into wealth, but it's still at a time when black people maybe are uh, expected to be servers and, and um, uh, still the holdover from slavery. Okay, so you're starting to think about the historical context um, that we're looking at. So you're thinking beyond what are they doing, but you're also thinking about what is this uh, image expressing. Um, so you've noticed the clothing. Um, th these are well-to-do, um, well-dressed figures. You've also brought up the color of their skin. So we're seeing black and brown skin colors, darker skin colors in all of the figures that are in the room but you've noticed the contrast between the skin color, what looks like the skin color of the figures in the background painting. So there's a, a direct contrast there. Then you've also brought up this piece of art and are wondering if this is a matriarch or somebody who's um, part of a family. And what you're specifically wondering about is if this expresses a transition in, in black culture or black standing in society. Um, we're seeing uh, wealth and uh, it, as you had mentioned, um, just the fashion and the revelry, we're seeing joy, an expression of joy, but we're also seeing uh, a server. Um, and, and that is making you think about the transition from uh, the transition in Black history. What more can we find? 
David. I was wondering if it was um, trying to, I'm trying to grapple whether it's a public or private space. I mean, at first glance, the, um, uh, the women around the table look like, you know, it's a very friendly home type space, but because they're all wearing their hats, um, it seems odd that they'd be wearing their hats if they were in fact, you know, in their own home or a friend of their home, um, which then would mean that the, um, uh, you know, the server is more of a waiter bringing a meal to the table. And also the figure in the lower left corner um, seems like they're, you know, maybe having, you know, reclining, having a, you know, resting their head on the, um, you know, on the side of the chair there. If it was a domestic scene, uh, you know, I mean, there's only two areas of private, you know, if it's a private space, that seems a little odd. If it's a public space, then there are these, you know, you know, a party of five and then a party of at least one or more. So I, I tend to think that it's a public space of some sort, even though it's filled with domestic clues. Okay, so you're starting to think about the atmosphere, the environment. Um, we've talked about what they're doing, we've talked about the historical context, and you're starting to think about uh, what is this space and how does that inform the way that we're looking at it. So you're wondering if this is a public space based on the fact that, the, that these figures have kept their hats on, um, which is not something that we would typically see if we were inside the home. And then also going back to the role of this figure here, um, who seems to symbolize a lot of things, but you're wondering if there would be a waiter like this inside a private home um, dressed in such a way. But the other reason you're wondering is you, you've drawn our attention to the figure in the lower left corner. This person, oops, sorry. This person is not really part of this group here. So you've noticed just two distinct groupings and you're wondering, is she part of another group that's maybe off, uh, off the canvas or just sitting there um, enjoying herself by, you know, alone. So thinking about the space and the difference between public and private and the way that uh, we present ourselves in public versus private spaces. What more can we find? I'm gonna take one more comment before we wrap it up. This is a super, super short VTS conversation. Allie, did I see you raise your hand? So I definitely, um, like Kylie, immediately noticed that these were all black female presenting individuals. Um, I secondly noticed a lot of how they're definitely very fashionable. Um, the hats, the dresses, um, and just sort of the, the vibrant colors. And so I definitely was getting a similar amount of, um, of cheer that, um, that was mentioned before and that this is definitely a festive occasion. Um, you know, I wasn't necessarily, didn't get caught up in sort of the public versus private and definitely a t an era, you know, you could have told me that this um, maybe was some, was a costume party or just sort of more of a, a, a themed restaurant or something like that. And it could have happened yesterday or definitely as was mentioned before, could have happened, um, you know, earlier in the 1900s when there's sort of a transition of wealth and power. Um, so I definitely was really feeling a lot of um, festivity, but I was also noticing, um, you know, the, you know, the dark blacks in the server's tuxedo and in the paintings on the wall and, um, you know, and a little bit in the, in the hair, but even just the dark blue of the, of the window and of the um, woman who has her back to us with the, the blue cardigan and the person who I, they, they kind of look like they're sleeping to me in the lower left-hand corner, um, that there's this really dark, this, a lot of these very dark, cool colors that's sort of contrasted with like these vibrant pinks. Like overall, I see a lot of pink and white and cheer. And so I was immediately um, called to those contrasts as well. All right, so Ali is drawing our attention to the palette, the color scheme of the piece. Um, and she first noticed the, the pinks, all the versions of pinks. We're seeing it in the clothing, we're seeing it on the walls, we're seeing it um, in the chandelier, we're seeing it um, on the carpet and, and even in the lamp. We're just getting an overall rosy sense. Um, she's also pointed out the highlights, the, the whites that appear in the painting. And that vibe is, is just giving her a sense of joy and revelry and celebration. Um, but there is contrast with all these dark colors that we're seeing. Um, we're seeing them in the furniture, in the clothing of the, the waiter, and, and even in the artwork, um, as well as some of the clothing and or the hair. So we're getting a great sense of um, color contrast. And that recalls the previous comments on noticing the contrast between the color of the skin in the background painting and the color of the skin 
um, of the figures in the foreground. So that color scheme um, is informing a lot of the way that we're, we're thinking about and processing this piece. Okay, now I know that we didn't get to hear from everybody. Um, and part of that is because BTS conversations take a while. Um, so I apologize if you didn't get to jump in and you volunteered to, to be a part of it. Um, I hope that you were able to um, participate in a way um, just as everybody else has, um, just by listening and thinking about what you're seeing um, that's different or similar to what was vocalized. So for those of you um, who are, um, who were volunteering, how was that experience? Feel free to chime in or raise your hand. Allie. So, um, you know, immediately I was feeling a lot of the same um, things that, um, sorry, I don't have everybody's name in, in front of me that Laura um, had mentioned. And then when, uh, when Kylie chimed in, I had a lot of similar thoughts, but then also was, um, I was impressed by like the commentary about the historical context and I felt silly for not thinking that. Um, you know, I, for me, like immediately that these were all black women who were very factually dressed immediately came to my attention. But then I almost, I was like, oh, well, why didn't I think of the fact that this could have been in a different time and place when there's power shifts and things like that. So I think I was also um, intimidated by the idea that there are very important things that I'm not seeing um, uh, that or that I didn't see until it was brought to my attention. Okay, so I would say that you were struck by um, the variety of comments, but then also the comments that made you notice or realize things that you just hadn't even comprehended up until that point. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, thank you. Others, how was that experience for you? Laura? I had similar thoughts too, so we both feel on the same page. And I had the opportunity of doing BTS uh, with uh, my core team. So uh, in that particular instance, I felt maybe more comfortable in terms of the sharing aspect of not having, you know, like with an unknown group of people. Uh, that was part of like crossing my mind uh, through the whole experience. But the same token, I think it was uh, great uh, hearing others' perspective and learning of other uh, aspects of the painting more in the history context so it was humbling because uh, I was not necessarily like looking at the picture in that way uh, so yeah overall a great experience okay so you're thinking about the difference between how it feels to be in VTS conversation with your colleagues people you know versus a group of this is a random group of um, people who've registered um, so not all of you know each other. Um, so it is different in terms of our comfort level and the way that we um, share what we see and how we interpret things when we know people versus when we don't. Um, this is definitely more accurate to what our visitors go through um, at museums if they're doing a VTS experience, but very different from how it would be in the workplace. Um, what did I do as the facilitator? So I have that as a kind of a faded question in intentionally. Um, you prompted, you followed up with us, um, and you, you rephrased what we said, well, um, and pointed things out and, um, helped make it clear to the whole group. Um, and when I asked a question, so I, like, as an educator, half my mind was still on the fact that, like, not everyone in the audience knows BTS, so I'm not going to immediately follow up with what I saw, and you prompted me, what did you see if that made you say that? Um, yeah, so um, yeah, people who are familiar with VTS often will launch into the evidence. Um, I say that because, um, whereas people who are less familiar may not automatically go into that. Um, but you mentioned the paraphrasing and the, the follow-up questions. Um, so that paraphrasing we'll come back to very briefly, but just the idea of acknowledging um, everyone's comments and giving us, uh, everybody in the group, a little bit of time to process what was said. So sometimes hearing it a second time in a different way really helps uh, frame what was said and helps it sink in. Thank you. Well, thank you to my volunteers. I really appreciate it. 
I'm going to move on to the rest of the presentation now. So for a quick BTS primer, uh, what is it? It is a facilitation method and it's also a professional development program that fosters collaborative, inclusive, and community building dialogue. So on the, on the very basic, it is a facilitation method. Um, and now what does it do? It effectively uh, strengthens, strengthens visual literacy um, and also critical thinking through audience-driven discussions. So with this type of um, experience, the audience is driving it, not the facilitator. So who created it? Um, again, this may be some, maybe review for some of you and new to some of you. It was created um, after decades of research by a cognitive psychologist named Abigail Hausen, uh, and in concert with a museum educator, Philip Yenowen, who used to be um, the director of education at Museum of Modern Art in New York. Um, he was tasked with uh, doing some research on the tour experiences at MoMA and uh, based on some surprising results that they got, he ended up reaching out to Abigail Hausen who had done uh, tons of research on the way that people view art um, and ended up doing tons and tons, 4,000 actually subject interviews um, asking people about how they're experiencing the visual world by looking at art. Um, as a result of that, they created a program that has been around for a few decades, and it's used by museums, historic sites, and uh, very much in, in many school systems, and also healthcare institutions internationally. We're seeing that um, in uh, some healthcare institutions and med schools here in the US, but we're also seeing a little bit more internationally. So I just wanna mention the stages of aesthetic development, not that we necessarily have time to unpack all of that, but this, based on Abigail Hausen's research, she was able to create her theory of the way that people view. And these different stages um, really just um, are able to, frame the way that people see and how people move up in their viewing of visual art. So stage one, um, the account of level is people who are very uh, new to looking at art and don't have much exposure to it. They tend to just list what they see. Stage two are constructive or people who tend to, they start to weave a narrative in there. Stage three of classifying are all of our art history people who want to they feel a need to place it in context with the art history. Um, this looks like a Diego Rivera because I've noticed the style because uh, stage four interpretive viewers um, start to put their own meaning to it, even with the uh, context that they have. Um, they're interpreting it in new ways. And then stage five are recreative. This is very rare. Um, usually people that get to this point are museum directors, curators, people who've spent a lifetime with art. And um, they, she, she described it as um, uh, viewing an old friend, um, people who look at art as an old friend where you're constantly finding new things about it, even though you know it extremely well. So that's just a very brief background on it. Now, the VTS basics are very clear, and this can all be found on the VTS website, the Visual Thinking Strategies Organization's website, which Scarlett is gonna pop into the chat. So the first thing is a group dynamic. Um, it's essential that there be a group. I have tried doing it with one other person. It does not work. Um, you can certainly have a conversation, but the tenets of VTS just don't work the same unless you have more than two people. Um, the ideal size is eight to 20, uh, which to me was, uh, was a little surprising, but eight to 20 is ideal. Preferably their peers from similar, similar life experiences, but different backgrounds and perspectives. And the one thing I wanna clarify is that the group dynamic here, it's not about building consensus. So the goal is not to get everybody to agree about what the artwork means. So the second tenet is that uh, art or visual content is the subject. Um, you should ideally allow 20 to even 30 minutes per image. 
um, that are carefully selected for the group and for the purposes of the program. And uh, in, in kinship with that is this idea of silent looking. So if you think about our society, we're so prone to staccato looking. We're scrolling on Instagram. We're just you know scrolling on our phones, looking at images. We're constantly processing images. But how often are we spending 15 to 20 minutes on one image? Uh, pretty much never. Um, so this part is necessary, and that's why we start off with silent looking at the very beginning. The fourth component is that the only questions asked are these three questions. What's going on in this picture? That's how I'd start off the conversation. When clarification is necessary, I would say, what do you see that makes you say that? What do you see that makes you say um, the, uh, that's a school in the background, if we're looking at the piece on the right. And what more can we find? Um, these questions are very carefully researched. They, they were, um, they got to this because of extensive trial and error. Um, and the one that I wanna call attention to that is really important is this, the use of the word more. Notice that the question is not what else can we find? It's what more can we find? Else tends to be a qualifying word. Um, it might imply that I'm looking for something specific as the facilitator. Um, more invites people in and suggests there's always more to see. There's always more to find. Um, there's all, there are always more clues to investigate. So it's more of a, an inclusive term. Uh, and keeps the conversation open versus uh, closing it off or making people nervous um, that they, they aren't gonna say the right thing. And the final component is skilled facilitation. Um, so it does take training. It seems simple on the outset. Uh, when you first experience it, it seems very simple. And when you start to do it, when, when you receive your training, it, it's, it, it quickly hits you how hard it is um, to stick to just those questions and then also to remain neutral. So part of the um, important responsibilities of the facilitator are pointing. Um, so you probably noticed I was frenetically moving my cursor um, to draw your attention to whatever the person was pointing out to us. Um, paraphrasing is a huge component of it as well. That's why after every single comment, um, I would rephrase it and uh, some quickly summarize and say it in a different way. Um, linking, if we'd had a little bit more time, linking would be more apparent. That's when you connect comments to each other. As Laura had said earlier, Ali is noticing blah, blah, blah. And then maintaining a neutral stance, as I mentioned. So at no point did I say, ooh, good observation, or Meh, yeah, no, not really. Um, I, all you have to do is think back to school uh, when you had a teacher who maybe responded to something that you asked or said in a negative way, it really made you feel embarrassed or silly or possibly even stupid, worst case scenario. And so by maintaining a neutrality, um, it keeps everybody on the same playing field and again, builds that inclusive environment that is audience driven. Erin, so, I do have a couple questions that have come sure. in, if yeah. you don't mind my asking. Um, they kind of go hand in hand together. So we do have um, all stages of aesthetic development. <laughs> Let me start over again. Are the stages of aesthetic development similar for persons of all learning styles and differences? And the follow-up question uh, from a different uh, participant was, has there been any research into whether the stages are different in different cultures? It seems like a culturally specific role of art in different, especially non-Western cultures, might restructure these stages? <clears throat> Excuse me. So I want to make sure I understand the question. So one is, um, are the stages of aesthetic development similar across learning styles? Mm -hmm. OK, so that's a really good question. And I actually don't know. And I actually don't know the answer to the question of um, across cultures. So Abigail Hausen was an American cognitive psychologist. And I don't know if her research extended outside of the US. Um, I don't want to comment too much on that with, because I don't want to put out some conjecture. But I would argue that it does depend on the culture's 
elevation of art. Um, but even in our culture, there can, you know, there can be people who are stage one simply because they've never been exposed to visual art on a continual basis. Um, in terms of learning styles, it does apply. So this is um, regardless of how you learn, it is simply a matter of how you experience something that you were looking at. And as they, um, so as Philip Yenowin continued, continued to do research, he found that that applies to anything visual. So it's not just art, but it can also apply to um, literature or uh, decoding text. Um, it can apply to objects as well, uh, maps and, and anything like that. So th it's, it's really just how your eyeballs are sending messages to your brain is what it is. And also I wanna specify that the stages of aesthetic development are not a, there's not a value statement. Um, her, her research was not to imply that stage five is better than stage one. It simply is. It just simply is where you're at based on exposure. Um, I hope that answers some of the questions. Okay. Thank you. I will unmute myself. <laughs> okay. All right, so for benefits, um, Continued exposure to VTS is proven to increase observation, communication, and critical thinking skills, sort of goes without saying. It improves people's ability to provide support for their statements, so providing evidence. So why are you saying that? It, it challenges people to not just make an, a, judgment or a judgment or an assumption, but to say, I, I think this because I'm seeing visual cues that give me that idea. It improves people's ability to consider multiple viewpoints and become comfortable with ambiguity. And it improves people's ability to decode and assess what they're looking at, um, just to unpack uh, what it is they've got before them. In addition to that, um, anybody can participate. So what I like to say is um, anyone with eyeballs can join. You don't have to have any experience with art. Um, it's really a low risk, easy entry activity um, where you don't even talk about art history in it uh, if you're doing strict VTS. So anybody can participate. Participants feel validated through this particular process because each comment is paraphrased and each comment is given equal weight. Um, and then what's interesting is that over time, group dynamics strengthens if the discussions are taking place with the same group of people regularly. So we can't see that with our visitors, but we can see that with um, in a classroom setting, for example, that's been researched with school children in a classroom setting when it's the same kids participating in these conversations. Um, so the same can apply um, to our workplace. So I want to um, have you guys pop some thoughts into the chat box. So when we're thinking about applying this to the workplace, why is the VTS process significant and how might it inform your workplace culture? Obviously, I have a few thoughts, but I want to see where, where your brains are at right now. Erin, did you want to take a quick look at the Q&A if you wanted to answer that now or um, later? Okay. Um, so the question is about tense group dynamics. Um, if someone's offended by someone else's interpretation of a piece, uh, how would you facilitate that? And then how does it work with um, DEAI type training? Um, so that's actually a really great question and I, I would love to go into more detail. Um, the process of VTS kind of neutralizes any um, offense that people might take because of the fact that it requires evidence. So that's not to say that somebody might come in, you know, rolling in hot with some judgmental statement, um, but the facilitator can neutralize that by saying, this is making you think of X. What do you see that makes you say that? And sometimes by having that extra step, it slows people down with going any further into the judgment or a judgmental statement, for example. Um, the other thing is the, um, the facilitator can use um, specific terms that are, are more um, accepted, can introduce new terms that the group might not be aware of. Um, and when it is absolutely necessary, the facilitator absolutely can call out uh, a term or um, an ideology that is incredibly offensive. 
So there, there's, there's actually articles on that on the VTS website. And in terms of DEAI, I see VTS as being complementary to DEAI work. Um, obviously, it does not replace it. DEAI is highly specialized and um, work that needs to be done, particularly in the workplace culture. Um, but because VTS has that um, easier access, low risk, um, invitation to people be in conversation with each other, even if they might disagree about an interpretation, um, it teaches people ways to respectfully disagree and to provide evidence for what they're saying, to provide evidence for assertions. Okay, so I just want to take a look in the chat here. So over time, you'd start to understand how your coworkers um, see, absolutely. Build comfort with expressing ideas. Open, open up employees to curiosity and um, expressing creativity. So what, what I would argue in this webinar is that VTS is a compelling tool to use with adult groups working together. We've seen extensive research of um, the effects VTS has on children um, with continued exposure, but there really hasn't been that much research uh, on adults. We'll go over some of that in just a minute, um, but there is compelling enough research to indicate its tremendous potential to impact positively workplace environments. Um, for our purposes today, I would suggest a couple of uses. Breaking down silos between departments at large institutions. Um, you know, we all know that uh, curatorial education, uh, conservation, uh, you know, there's so many different departments that see things very differently. So breaking down those silos would be helpful. Bringing together various level of staff, um, frontline and all the way up to senior. Improving dynamics between executive leadership and the boards. Um, and or team building for large groups of docents and educators, for example. So there's a couple of suggested uses in the workplace. The other thing that I want to just briefly mention is that, you know, as we're thinking about DEAI, uh, which is obviously um, prevalent on people's minds in our current environment and after 2020, self-awareness as a tool for empathy um, is hugely important because the more aware we are of our own thought patterns, internal biases, and cognitive limitations, the more likely we are to be more open to other people's experiences and perspectives. So when we think about that, I would argue that art can be a tool for subjectivity, um, but it also brings out the possibility of simultaneously holding subjectivity and objectivity. So why might that be the case? How can we hold both simultaneously with art as the impetus? So it's this idea of interpreting art and what you're seeing in a highly personal way, but then also challenging yourself to back up and see the big picture and putting it in context with other people's, uh, other people's comments. Erin, I did have a question come in. Um, yeah. So when you mentioned looking at artwork, would it be better with pieces from your own collection or with pieces less familiar to your team? Great it's a question. Good one. <laughs> yeah, we're gonna go over that um, okay. in just a few slides. So okay, okay. Um, applications to the workplace. So you might be thinking, why should we use our own museum education methodology on ourselves? And I would just very easily say, why not? Um, honestly, you know, if you think about it, it's like, why have we not? Um, in particular, VTS is a practice well-researched technique. Uh, many of you are already familiar with it. Many of your frontline um, educators, people who interact with visitors may already be trained in it or partially trained in it, or at least familiar with it. Um, we know that the effects on students and visitors is compelling. We are responsible for practicing what we preach. You know, in the museum community, we love to talk about um, empathy and social justice and, you know, all these initiatives, but how often are we implementing that internally with our staff? This work is hugely important. 
The other thing is it's a, it's a no or low cost professional development and team building um, that leads to workplace productivity. And we'll see what I mean in just a minute. And then also it just promotes employee wellness and creativity bursts by focusing on something that's not work related with our work colleagues. So what about the data? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you what I know and some data that I uh, have been able to call from my experiences. So it's more research with adults in medical education. Um, if you're interested in its use with children, there's a whole host of that. Philip Yenowin has written books about it. You can go to the DTS website. Um, in terms of adults, we've really only seen research on it in medical settings. And um, I just wanna show this graph here from, a, from an article that came out in 2008. And really the crux of this is demonstrating that the more sessions attended, the greater the improvement of visual diagnostic skills. Um, and this is really impressive um, results. The other thing I wanna point out is that this line here, these are three different groups uh, that attended different sessions. They all started off on the relative same baseline. So it wasn't like this group had superstar art people in it to see this kind of result. They all started off, these are medical students, they all started off around the same place in terms of where they were diagnostically, their visual strengths. And they saw this level of improvement after eight to nine. That tends to be the sweet spot before you really start to see dramatic results. There's uh, a host of other articles that demonstrate its uh, power and use in medical education and then also with uh, medical practitioners healthcare practitioners. And this is uh, another article that was published that actually shows the benefits from one 90 minute session. It was a lecture and interactive um, VTS discussion about art. And these are the results self the, through the self-assessment that the student, the medical students, um, what they said. So I think this is just astonishing that after one session, they were seeing that kind of increase in their ability to accept multiple meeting, meanings. But it also goes to show that improved team dynamics and teamwork ability takes time. That is not going to happen from a one and done. That happens over time with continued VTS sessions. Now, in the um, case of my experience, so um, over the past few months, I've done a couple of VTS cohorts with a random group of people, and we met once a week for eight weeks and just did one VTS conversation. It was really very basic. Um, and they did a pre and post assessment of their own skills. And what you're seeing is the percentage of change and improvement uh, based on their self assessments. Um, so clearly this is great. This supports the idea of the visual literacy, building visual literacy um, and the comfort with talking about our, with other people. But we're also seeing an increase in listening skills, consideration of multiple viewpoints, et cetera. So I wanna hone in on um, three particular areas. So we saw a, sign a statistically significant increase in listening skills, verbal communication and considering multiple viewpoints. And what this number here means is that it's 99% likely that these changes are not due to chance, but due to the intervention. And in this case, the intervention is a VTS. Now I wanna give you another case study. Um, in working with company X, I'm not listing their name, uh, after five contact hours of VTS conversations, creative prompts, writing and visualization exercises, uh, these are the results. Now, uh, we did not do pre-surveys. This is just summative evaluation. So this is what they said at the end of the experience. And what I thought was absolutely remarkable is that 90% um, indicated that listening skills were strengthened the most. They were encouraged to check however many applied, that the top two were listening and communication. I was not you know, the, the improvement in listening was a little bit less with a group of individuals who did not know each other. But with a group of individuals who did know each other, they seemed to score listening as higher. You're also seeing a greater number, a greater percentage uh, marking an in increase in team building. Um, and this is a, just five hours. And if you think back to the medical 
education one, after that 90 minute session, we were really only seeing like a 30% increase. So by five hours, we're closer to 60%. The other thing is I wanted to get, you know, um, the, the graphs are great, but I know, uh, you know, those of us in the museum community, we, we love the um, qualitative data as well. So um, with this same company, um, I asked them what their um, most meaningful part of the experience was. And these are some of the comments that I got. So keep in mind, the most meaningful part, uh, meaningful being a word that museum educators love, um, this translates to the, the part of the experience that resonated most with them and that they are most likely to remember and walk away with. Learning my work family's view of the images and how many of them were able to build off one another and all were open to different ideas listening to everyone's thoughts about the pieces. These experiences provide clear evidence that everyone has a different perspective and that I need to stay curious in understanding these different perspectives. And getting to have some team building time not focused on company X specifically. So in, in thinking about the resulting toolbox, um, what I specifically look at in the programs um, that I lead through Yellow Room Consulting, and, and certainly in particular with VTS, are these categories. So I've sort of narrowed it down to these categories and then some specifications within those categories. These seem to be the strongest areas that are um, improved and activated through these types of activities. Um, certainly through continued exposure. And I want to keep going back to that because it's not a quick fix, as, as we know from most things. So when you look at this um, chart, we're, we're really seeing qualities that contribute to productivity in the workplace and worker well-being. Uh, companies' team dynamics improve. And not only do employees experience imaginative team building, but they also learn how to apply that new way of thinking to meetings, group problem solving, and collegial relationships. So that's where we're seeing tremendous potential for benefit in the workplace. Um, in addition, this type of thing gives your employees a creative brain break um, and associated stress relief that comes with viewing art. Um, Many of us from art institutions and, and museums in general understand that incorporating art into our daily life is proven to reduce anxiety, fosters creativity, um, and it also provides a healthy escape um, from daily stressors. And it takes so little time. So you may be wondering, okay, that's great. Um, how can I do this um, at my home institution? So these are my suggestions for how you can do it. If you are sold on this idea of using VTS internally, and I hope you are, this is what I have to say. You need to decide on the group. If you're at a large institution, you cannot do this with everybody all at once. Um, so no more than 20 people is ideal. So you've got to decide which group dynamic is the one that you need to focus on. Um, or could it be everybody? How are you going to break down the groups? But keeping in size, group size. Um, and also, if you're at a smaller institution, um, keep in mind that I had said the ideal size is eight to 20, but you can successfully do these types of conversations with as little as five people. You need to commit to regular conversations and they need to be scheduled on the staff calendar. You know, you all know how it is and you have the best of intentions. You talk about an idea in a meeting and then it's like, yeah, 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 we're gonna do this. And then if it's not scheduled, nobody is gonna remember to do it and nobody's gonna implement. So once you've decided on the group, You've got to decide on the time and it's got to be on whatever calendar everybody is aware of and then commit to it. Clearly, you need to dedicate a facilitator um, or more if you maybe if you have several people trained in VTS or several people who want to do this type of thing. Um, you can also hire a consultant, somebody like me. Um, there are many people uh, trained in VTS who can assist you with that. And the other thing is, I would say, if you don't have anybody who if you don't have anybody trained in VTS, don't let that deter you, because even if you're not doing VTS as prescripted and as created and you're not trained in it, even just having these conversations about art can have similar effects. You want to carefully select images, preferably from outside the institution. So this goes back to the question um, that I received earlier. The reason for that is you want to keep everybody on the same playing field. 
if you are choosing items from your own collection and you are breaking down silos between departments, well, clearly curatorial is going to have an edge or clearly education is going to have an edge if they have talked about these pieces or these objects. So this is not a time for you to utilize your own collection for discussion if you want to level the playing field. So I would suggest um, looking at collections from other institutions or just using this as an opportunity um, to, to pick a variety of art images. I mean, there's so much out there. There's really not ever going to be a lack of compelling images to use. You wanna evaluate um, and include writing activities and reflection that as we, as, um, I'm trained as a museum educator, so we know that helps people process. Um, and the evaluation will be helpful in terms of reporting to your board, or if you were to pursue something like this um, with grants, um, wanting to do internal professional development and team building, the, the data of what you're seeing is important. Also, it's important to help motivate the team. If you, if the, you as the team are seeing improvements in certain areas, that can motivate you to keep it going and to encourage other employees to be excited about it as well. And then I would say after eight sessions, uh, I would say do a minimum of eight and then try to start applying the same approach to problem solving in meetings or team projects. So for example, um, what's going on in this picture? You can say, uh, what's going on in this scenario or what's, what's going on with the problem we have at hand? And then people can talk about it and you can paraphrase what people are saying what do you see that makes you say that or you know what what makes you say this as a suggestion and then what more can we find what more as a team can we find in this scenario because it is very easy to think we've come to a, an answer or a solution and there are usually more ways to look at the same scenario Um, Scarlett is going to pop these reflection questions into the chat box. So if you would like, you can copy and paste them from the chat box um, onto a Word document. This is a way for you all to reflect on and think about um, the webinar. I know we went through a lot of material and an hour is a short period of time to begin to process how you can implement this at home. Um, so think about how you can use this at your company. What is the most exciting aspect of ETS? And then what are some other ways that I can promote worker wellness and workplace satisfaction with visual material and collections? VTS is one way. There are many ways um, that you can engage your staff and even utilize your own collection if you're doing different types of activities. So I highly encourage you to, to give this some thought. We are at a time where work, worker wellness is hugely important, as is productivity. Uh, especially when we're still working from home, we're seeing a major transition in workplace culture and the way museums are operating. Uh, so let me know if you end up implementing this. I would love to. Uh, I would love to hear from you. And uh, I am gonna. We are gonna have a few minutes for questions, but I encourage you to stay connected with me. I'm very active on LinkedIn, so please connect with me there if you'd like. I know I'm connected with many of you already. Um, I do have an eight part uh, lunchtime workshop series coming up that's it's really like art education is self care, we are going to be doing VTS. Um, and this is for anybody who wants to register so it's not going to be um, people you know, but it will be the same group for eight weeks and we'll be doing things besides VTS as well so it's really for this session or this series we will be looking at um, self care, self reflection, and um, using art as an impetus for creativity. And then also, um, if you're interested, let's work together. Um, I'd love to help you uh, provide some kind of experience or professional development opportunity for your team. And um, resulting contracts from this NEMO webinar get a discount. So email me if you are interested in, in taking me up on that offer. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions at this time. Um, I do have a couple. So um, how long should each of the sessions be for the workplace and how many images? Great question. Uh, and I'm surprised I did not put that in there. <laughs> so um, I, I recommend an hour, a minimum of 45 minutes, and I would do two. So the data that I showed you from my cohorts, um, back a few slides, 
uh, is from one. So we had eight sessions where we only talked about one piece of art. And my argument here would be that more pieces of art and the more mini conversations you have, the greater the benefit. Um, but I would devote a minimum of 45 minutes to an hour. So a, a lunchtime, I think, is a great time. Or if you were to replace a, an hour long staff meeting with this, um, that would be a way to go. So that was a, it was how many and time, right? Yep. And then um, we do have a follow up kind of similar to that one. Um, you did a great, this is from David. So you did a great job starting us off on BTS via Zoom. Our staff is meeting remotely at present. Any helpful hints when facilitating virtually rather than in the gallery? I think we are all struggling with that. Yeah. So um, it absolutely can be done virtually. You just have to have a dedicated facilitator. Um, so part of the reason I started doing the BTS cohorts um, just with these groups of people was for me to practice doing BTS virtually because I'm used to doing it in person and being in front of the piece of art. Um, there's my timer, keeping me <laughs> honest. <laughs> um, so in doing it virtually, you just have to select the piece of art ahead of time and have somebody uh, dedicated to being in the facilitator role. Um, I, I highly believe that the benefits are the same. Um, and this is a really compelling way to bring everybody together for team building at a time when you cannot all be in the same office. Okay. And then early, uh, one of your earlier slides, you referenced a couple medical um, articles. Are those also on the BTS website? So I believe most of them are. Let me go back to find myself. Um, it was these, right? Um, mm -hmm. I'm going to leave them up for just a minute. Uh, I know the Refining the Eye article is on the VTS website because they have additional articles that you can link to. The validation scale, I'm not sure if it is. Actually, I think the bottom two are not. I know it's been written up quite a bit because you do see the VTS when um, with training and stuff like that through museums and medical students. So. Yeah, I think if you're Googling it, this, this stuff will come up. This isn't, um, these are not difficult uh, articles to come by. Okay, and then one final one. Is there any evidence that BTS increases cross-cultural cross fluency? So that is, that's a really interesting question. And it's one that I'm, I'm interested in, um, in particular in use with corporate, in, uh, corporate companies. Uh, in thinking about companies that are preparing to do work internationally, um, one of the things that's been on my mind is, is doing VTS with artwork from the culture they're planning to do work in going to make a significant difference in the way that they interact with their um, clients or customers in another country. Um, I don't, I don't have any data on that. My hunch is yes. Um, but in a limited way, because unless the facilitator has extensive knowledge of that culture um, and has done some research on it, and VTS is the launch point into a learning experience about that culture, it may not work as effectively. So there's, I'm of two minds. One is just exposure to whatever culture you might be wanting to be more fluent in. Um, just exposure to more artwork is huge. Um, but then if you wanted to take it a step further, what would be even more helpful is if the conversation of ETS is a launch point, you're using a specific type of art from this culture, and then ideally the facilitator has done a little bit of research and can put some of that into context. Uh, so that's, a, that's an interesting direction that I'm, I'm wanting to pursue um, in the long run. I would love to see some research on it myself. I think it would be a good idea. But we are past the one o'clock hour. So I do want to thank you, Erin, for presenting this and all your work that you do, especially helping out with NEMA. We do appreciate that. I can't thank our volunteers enough. Um, if you are ever interested in presenting at a lunch with NEMA, definitely contact one of the NEMA staff. We also have some really cool upcoming programs. So uh, make sure to check the NEMA website, including New England Museums Week. Um, March 8th through the 12th. We also have our call for proposals for our annual conference, which are due March 12th. Erin, do you have any final thoughts <laughs> on this um, beautiful so thank all of you. day? Um, I know, again, I know that was a lot of information um, and I, I went through it very quickly. So please feel free to reach out to me if you have um, additional questions or are wanting some a particular direction. I saw one question on where does one get VTS training. If you go to the vtshome.org website, they offer um, trainings, beginner practicum, advanced practicum, all the way up to becoming a coach. 
Um, and that's who I got trained through. So um, check, check them out. Um, they have all kinds of um, free resources in addition to the paid training as well. Um, all right, well, thank you everybody. Um, good luck. I, I hope that you're inspired by this and end up working towards some, some kind of internal process or program that helps uh, everybody in, in your home institution feel more connected. All right, thanks and hope to see you at a future meeting. <laughs>